text for the sermon this morning is Psalm 103, verses 17 and 18. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, it should be clear to all of us that Psalm 103 is a joyful song of praise to Jehovah God for his mercy. It's a mercy that the psalmist has experienced in the forgiveness of his sins. The Lord's Supper form rightly quotes from this psalm extensively at the conclusion of the form, exactly because at the time of the Lord's Supper, the congregation has examined themselves carefully. They have seen their own sins and their own sinfulness and been convicted of that. But they have also tasted of the forgiveness of our God and of His great mercy. That instead of our being chastised and cast away from God as we deserve, we are forgiven. The mercy of God is the cause, therefore, of great gladness because of of the forgiveness of our sins. But there's more to the mercy of God and our, our joy in that mercy. It's because that mercy is upon us, though we are surrounded by death and all the effects of death, all the troubles of this life. This psalm is not a sad song. It's a song of praise and joy, and yet it deals with the reality that we are surrounded by death, that we are but grass, and like the flower of the grass that is flourishing for a day or so, and then the hot wind and the sun come, and it soon dies and falls to the ground, and it knows no more. It is known no more. That's what this life is like, and it's full of the effects of death. Sickness, sorrow, disease, hardship, heartache, that's our life. And in the midst of that, the psalmist recognizes that though we are as grass that fade and die, God's mercy is upon us. All these troubles and sorrows that come upon us are not God's attempt to destroy us. They are not an evidence that God is against us but we sing of the mercy of God even as we are surrounded by, even as we are being weighted down by the troubles and the sorrows of life. Life would be unbearable for us. The troubles and sorrows of life would be unbearable for us except for this, God's mercy which is upon us. The text that we consider this morning is tremendously encouraging from a number of points of view. It assures us that God's mercy is everlasting. It cannot fail. It will never be taken away from us. No matter how you may not be conscious of it, no matter how the troubles of life may press upon us, His mercy never fails. It assures us not only that, but that the righteousness of God is upon children's children. Not only upon us, but upon our children in the covenant. We and our children are sinners. We are fallen in Adam. We are conceived and born in sin. We need not only God's forgiving mercy, but we need that mercy that will hold us up and sustain us throughout all of our life. What hope do parents have of ever raising their children in the fear of God when they consider, I am a sinner, my children are sinners. How will this ever work that I will instruct my children so that they will keep the commandments of God, so that they will walk in His truth, that the covenant will be continued with me and with my children. How can that ever happen? 
And the answer is God's mercy, which is from everlasting to everlasting. So we consider this under the theme, Jehovah's Everlasting Covenantal Mercy. A little different from what I gave the bulletin clerk. Jehovah's Everlasting Covenantal Mercy. Notice in the first place the merciful covenant. Secondly, the gracious blessings. And finally, the godly participants in Jehovah's Everlasting Covenantal Mercy. God's covenant is a covenant of mercy. Mercy is clearly on the foreground in this text, and mercy is a beautiful attribute of God. Children, understand what an attribute is. An attribute is a characteristic of a person that makes him to be the way he is. We speak of the characteristics or the attributes of people. We say this person is tall. That's one of his attributes. This person is short. That's one of his attributes. We say this person has blonde hair. This person has red hair. Those are attributes of the person. We can say this person has the ability to paint pictures. That's an attribute. This person has the ability to understand mathematics and do well. This one is fast. These are all attributes of the people. They belong to them. They make them to be what they are. God has attributes. But in distinction from us where we can say this person is tall, we don't say this person is tallness. He's not the essence of being tall. We just say that's one of the things that describes him. But when we go to God, we say God is his attributes. We don't merely say that God is merciful, that that describes him. We say God is mercy. He is that. God's mercy is a beautiful attribute. It is closely related to the attribute of love. But whereas in love God draws His people unto Himself and embraces them and blesses them in that way because He draws them to Himself, mercy is God's attribute in which God determines to bless the one whom he loves. You really can't have mercy on someone unless you love them. And God loves his people and he has mercy upon them. And that mercy is his desire to lift them up and to bless them. That's the essence of God's mercy. The Bible doesn't define it as, of course, I can't just quote a text, but I can give you some texts where the mercy of God is on display. We all learn this as children. Psalm, 1, or Psalm 23, verse 6, the end of the beautiful, the Lord is my shepherd psalm, the very last verse, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and then what's the conclusion? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God has, by his goodness and his mercy, will lift me up into his house. Or Genesis 39, 21. Genesis 39, 21 says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And, and did, they, did, did Joseph ever need that? He was in prison. He was locked away in prison. He figured he would be there the rest of his life. But we read, but the Lord showed him mercy. God lifted him up and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Mercy as an attribute of God, of course, has always been with God because it makes him to be what he is, a merciful God. God is merciful even, therefore, apart from any creature. Before he said, let there be, before he created any creatures, he still was within himself a merciful God. So that within the Trinity, that beautiful life that God has within the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit are merciful toward each other. They are always desiring the blessedness of each other. And God, of course, the only good. He is worthy of the highest blessing 
He is worthy of that. This isn't some selfish thing that God has within Himself, but because He's the absolute good, He deserves the highest happiness. That same powerful mercy of God that He has within Himself is a mercy now that He bestows upon creatures. And He determines that those creatures will experience something of the blessedness that is His, that they will be happy, that they will be lifted up and experience His happiness. God's mercy is particularly evident then toward those who are in misery. That's why we usually think of mercy in times of our troubles, our misery. When we are low, the mercy of God is upon those who are a sinful people who live in the misery of their sin, a people who deserve to be cast into hell, a people who bring all sorts of misery upon themselves because of their sins, and yet God is merciful. And the mercy of God has two parts to it. If you look through Scripture, there's two parts to God's mercy, two distinct aspects. And the first is pity. When God looks upon His people in their trouble and their suffering, He has pity upon them, and He wants to bring them up out of their suffering. There is sympathy or pity towards them. And then the second aspect of God's mercy is that He actually does lift them up. And that's often the aspect of God's loving kindness. Both of those aspects are spoken of here in the text. As a father pitieth his children, as a father has mercy upon his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear Him. There's that one aspect. And then the loving kindness in verse 4, redeemeth thy life from destruction and crowneth thee with loving kindness. Loving kindness. Mercy is not merely that you look at someone and say, oh, that's too bad that they have all that sorrow, but mercy goes out to them and says, how can I deliver them from their sorrows? How can I lift them up and make them to be happy? That's what God's mercy does. Out of sorrow, he makes his people to experience joy, laughter, happiness. The mercy of God, therefore, is clearly essential in his work of salvation. According to his mercy, the Bible says, according to his mercy, he begets us. He begets us. The very first work God does in us our regeneration is according to His great mercy. 1 Peter 1.3 When God heard the cries of Israel languishing as slaves in Egypt, their children being put to death, the men being whipped to death, when God heard their cries, it was in mercy that He came to deliver them. His mercy. The greatness of God's mercy is on display as He led them out of the land of Egypt through the Red Sea and led them out of their bondage. But that's salvation. That's a picture of what God does for us. The greatness of God's mercy, that's only a picture. The reality is found in our lives as He delivers us out of the bondage of sin, as He brings us out of our captivity and brings us into life and fellowship with Him. That is mercy on display. But the mercy of God is also an integral part of His covenant. There are many texts in the Bible that connect those two things, the mercy of God and the covenant of God. Let me give you a few. Deuteronomy 7.9. Deuteronomy 7, 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy. He keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Or again, Psalm 89, the beautiful covenant psalm. Psalm 89, verse 28, My mercy will I keep for him, for Christ, my son, his son, my mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. My mercy will I keep, my covenant I will keep. New Testament, the same. Luke 1, 72. 
to perform the mercy promise to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. So those two things go together, the covenant of God and the mercy of God, as they do also in the text. We have it at the evidence of that, first of all, in that the mercy of the Lord, the mercy of Jehovah, the covenant name of God, immediately in verse 17. And then, more explicitly, to, to such as keep His covenant. The covenant of God is a merciful covenant. And God is a covenant God. The covenant describes the very life within God. The life within God is a life of love and friendship. As the Father begets the Son in His own image, in His own beautiful perfections, in love. And the Son being begotten of the Father reflects the perfections of God. And the Spirit is the one who makes that to be a lively union there, that the Spirit proceeds from the Father to the Son with the words of love from the Father to the Son. And then the Spirit takes the loving thoughts and expressions of the Son and returns to the Father. And there is therefore intimate life and fellowship between the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. That's the life of God. That's the covenant life of God. A life of friendship and love. But God determined eternally to form for Himself a people that He would call my covenant people and that those people would be brought into the very covenant life of God in such a way that they would experience Something of what God has within Himself in the Trinity. Something of the love that is there. Something of the fellowship that is there. God said, I will bring my people into my own covenant life. The covenant, therefore, that God establishes with us is is based on that life that God has. And that's why we're absolutely sure, among many other reasons, That the covenant that God has established with us is not some kind of a cold business agreement. That God comes to us and says, now here's the conditions, here's the terms. This is what I promise to do. If you promise, all right, do we have a deal here? That's not the covenant. Nor does God send out His covenant to everyone and say, well, here are the conditions. If anybody wants to be my covenant people, go ahead. You have faith and then you can be a friend of mine and we will enjoy the covenant life together. That's not the way God works. The way God works is what we read in the baptism form, as God came to Abraham in Genesis 17 and said, I will establish my covenant. I do that. I establish my covenant between me and thee. God's covenant. He establishes. And therefore, that covenant that He establishes reflecting the glorious life of God Himself is a life of friendship that God has with us, His covenant people. He's our God. He loves us. He draws near to us. He delights to dwell with His people, something any father here can understand who longs to dwell with His people, who longs to have fellowship with His children, rather, with His children. As a father in this life, longs for that with his own children. God delights in his children. That is so hard for us even to comprehend until you put it in terms of a father-child relationship. Then you can understand God loves us. And so in the Old Testament, he said, build me a house, a tabernacle, so that I can dwell in your midst. And then he sent the Son, the mediator of the covenant, in order that the Son, through, that God through the Son, would dwell among His people. And after the Son left, He came by His Spirit, and the Spirit dwells within the hearts of His people. And eternally He has a place in heaven for us where we can live with Him. God delights to dwell with us. Now you can see, can't you, why covenant and mercy 
are so closely connected, how they're intertwined in Scripture. Let me mention four things that show how closely they are connected. First of all, they both have the same goal, the same end or goal. The mercy of God is His desire to lift up His people, to bring, to bring them into happiness, out of their misery and suffering, to make them to be happy with the happiness that God Himself has. That's what mercy intends. And that's the power to do it. But that's the covenant. What is the greatest blessedness of man? It is to know God and to live with Him and enjoy God forever. That's the covenant. The mercy of God is to bring that about. The covenant of God is to bring that about. The highest blessedness of God's people. And of course, mercy of God is not a mere desire. But it's part of God Himself. It's an attribute of God. And therefore, it's a power of God that accomplishes what He has determined. So mercy and the covenant have the same goal to lift up God's people to the highest blessedness, life with God. Secondly, both mercy and covenant are inseparably connected with the atonement. The atonement. God's mercy to His people in their sin was set forth in the atoning sacrifices of the Old Testament. The only way that they could approach to God, the only way that, that fellowship could be possible with God was with blood in their hands, the blood in the bowl, and sprinkling it upon the mercy seat, bringing their sacrifices, putting their hands upon the lamb in order to symbolize the fact that the guilt of the man and his family was transferred to the animal, and then the animal put to death an atoning sacrifice on the mercy seat of God. That is the heart of it. And the mercy of God is on display in the reality in the cross of Jesus Christ. The highest, the most beautiful, brilliant display of the mercy of God is there on Calvary. God displaying His intent to lift His people up. And bless them. But the covenant is also connected to the atonement. The atonement, the atoning work of Jesus Christ is the ratification of the covenant. It's the realization of the covenant. In the cross of Jesus Christ, we are adopted as his children. And all the blessings of the covenant become ours in and through the cross alone. So the atonement is inseparably connected with both the covenant and God's mercy. The same goal, both rooted in the covenant and connected to the covenant. Both mercy and, co and, and the covenant in the third place are eternal. The text emphasizes that the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, but so is the covenant. God said, I will establish my covenant between me and thee for an everlasting covenant. And that word seed there, of course, is Jesus Christ. And that means that the covenant is not merely everlasting in the sense that it has no end, but the covenant is eternal in the sense that it has no beginning. It was with Jesus Christ eternally and with all those who are in Jesus Christ because He's the seed, essentially, of Genesis 17, 7. God's mercy and His covenant. The covenant of God is not an afterthought. It's not as if God determined Adam should live with Him in, gracious, in fellowship on this earth and maybe someday take Him to heaven if He obeyed long enough. But then when Adam sinned, now he has to come up with something new, and so he has a covenant of grace? Absolutely not. The covenant of God was eternal with Jesus Christ. He always determined the fall. He always determined that the true mediator of the covenant and head of the covenant is Jesus Christ, not Adam. The covenant is eternal. And finally, the mercy of God that He bestows upon man is limited to the covenant. Mercy is on those that fear Him. His mercy is not on all men. 
God's mercy is unchangeable as God is unchangeable. And only those who are in the covenant, truly covenant children, covenant people, only they know God's mercy. No one else. We'll say more about that in our third point. God's covenant and His mercy, inseparable. In that covenant of mercy, and flowing out of God's mercy toward us, His people, are many blessings. The text highlights a blessing. It is not merely stating a fact, though it is a fact, but it is stating a blessing to us when it says, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Essentially, what's described there is your salvation, unchangeable and sure. Because the mercy of God is from everlasting, it means it is rooted in eternity. And therefore, clearly, election is implied, if not outright stated in this text. It's implied because He eternally knew His people. He eternally loved them because His mercy was upon them eternally. The mercy of God did not start when you were born. That's astounding to think about that. God has known you eternally. Before He said, let there be, before He created the heavens and the earth, before He formed you in the womb, His mercy, His determination to bless you and to make you experience the happiness and the blessedness of God, it was already in God's mind. It was already there. God's mercy is from everlasting. God's mercy is unto everlasting. There's no end to it. This carries us through the end of our life. This carries us beyond the grave into eternity. God's mercy, it's promised here to you. God's mercy is upon you for an eternity. He will forever delight to show you His blessedness so that you will be blessed. God will not tire of you. Think about that. Husbands and wives sometimes can get tired of each other. That's a sin, but that's true. Parents and children can sometimes get tired of each other from living with each other. God will never get tired of you. He'll never say, well, I've had enough of this. I don't want to talk to you anymore. I want some new people. I want some people that are more interesting. His mercy is promised to be upon you for an eternity. A mercy that will eternally will determine your greatest blessedness. That's God's mercy. And what does that mean for us now? The mercy of God is from everlasting. He always had that. The mercy of God is into eternity. And that means it's upon us now. There is no point in your existence, even before your existence, and into eternity and all through your life now, there is no point in your life where the mercy of God is somehow gone. It's upon you every single moment of your life. The mercy of God that is pity, and we need that. And don't think now, first of all, of the troubles and sorrows of life, but think about our sins. God sees us in our sins, and if He didn't care about us, He would just let us go. But He has pity upon us. 
And so He turns us. He gives us the spirit of repentance. He causes us to confess those sins and to turn away from those sins so that we turn back to God. Why do you repent? Because of God's mercy, which is always upon you. A mercy that takes pity on you. A mercy that changes and turns you around. Day after day, that mercy is upon us. We sing of that. Every single morning we wake up and His mercies are new unto us again. Not only that, but the mercy of God is upon us in our sorrows and in the troubles of life. How important this is. We are as grass, says the psalmist. We are weak. We are perishing. The smallest touch of God's pinky and we are laid in a bed of affliction. A stroke, a heart attack, cancer. And we are laid flat and cannot even function. We are overcome by sorrows, by the sorrows and lonelinesses of life, by family troubles or church troubles. And we all face the reality that one day we will die. Life does not go on endlessly. But God is never absent from us in His mercy. Even when the weight is so heavy that it crushes or threatens to crush us, even though our pillows may be stained wet with our tears night after night, His mercy is never gone. Now, understand that that mercy of God is not this. That is, at the first sign of tears in our eyes, at the first pain that we feel in our body or in our soul, that God rushes in immediately and says, oh, oh, it's okay, it's all right. Takes away all the troubles, all the sorrows, and there's no more, no more tears. That's not the way God's mercy works. Because, you see, God in His mercy has determined a goal for you. Your highest blessedness is reaching that goal, which is different for every one of us. Essentially the same, eternal life, but, but a different place in heaven. And everything in your life, as we sang, Thou wilt lead me, guide me by thy counsel. Everything in our life is bringing us to our place in heaven. So the mercy of God which is upon us is actually keeping us in that affliction until the moment that God has accomplished whatever He has determined. And at that moment, His mercy lifts us up out of the misery, ultimately to bring us to heaven. But the mercy is always upon us every moment, in all our sorrows. Otherwise, we could not go on. Another blessing spoken of in the text is that His righteousness is unto children's children. God's righteousness, that's another beautiful attribute of God. One of the things that makes God to be what He is. And the righteousness of God is an attribute closely connected to His holiness. In the holiness of God, He is perfect. No sin, no imperfection. God is purity. God is holiness. The righteousness of God is connected to that, is related to it in this way, that the righteousness of God is the attribute of God in which God is always in perfect harmony with Himself. Every thought that God has is always in harmony with His perfect holiness. Every word that He speaks, every deed that He commits, He is always in perfect harmony with His own being, His own perfections. That's what God's righteousness is. Righteousness for us is that we are perfectly in harmony with the law of God because the law is the expression of the righteousness of God. 
You want to know what it is to be righteous? Read the Bible, take out the law. There is the expression of God's righteousness. For us to be righteous, we must be in harmony with that law of God. But now there, of course, is the issue. We are not righteous by nature. We are born corrupt. And every day we only continue to break God's law. We are bent and perverse and corrupt. God made that plain from the fact that they had to have an atoning sacrifice to take away their guilt and their sin. But the astounding promise of the text is that God's own righteousness is upon us and our children and our children's children. God determined to take His righteousness and put it upon us And the way in which God would do that is indeed a marvel, a wonder. God would do this through His own Son, Jesus Christ. Christ would come and take the guilt of His people and bear their iniquity and their guilt and the curse and go the way of satisfying the justice of God and removing all of the sin of His people so that we are no longer guilty. And then not only that, but Christ would fulfill the perfect righteousness of God in His obedience, obeying God on the cross in His whole life so that a a righteousness which belongs to the very Son of God, His own righteousness, is now imputed to us. We are righteous. We are justified in Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. This blessing... God extends not only to us, but to our children. This is a blessing of the covenant, that God establishes His covenant not only with believers, but with their children, and implies the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ by faith alone to the children. That determines how we look at our children. They are covenant children. That's why we bring them to baptism. Because God establishes His covenant with believers and their seed. And as circumcision was a sign and seal of the righteousness by faith, so baptism becomes the New Testament sign and seal that we are righteous in Jesus Christ. And the text says, indeed they are. Those children are to be viewed as righteous. They are to be educated as righteous. They're still sinners. That's always, of course, the the wonder of justification, that we are declared righteous by God at the same time that we are sinful. But the promise is, they are righteous. That's how we treat them. We don't... Even though we will call them to repentance, we will when they walk in sin. We do not call them to repentance in the sense of you are a heathen here and now you have to be converted for the first time. Not at all. We bring them to Jesus Christ. They are covenant children. We treat them that way. They deserve to be instructed as covenant children. And the blessing is that God does save His church from our children. He's not obligated to do that. He doesn't have to do that. But it's because of His mercy upon us and upon our children that He determines to save them and bring them unto Himself in blessed covenant life. What a blessing that is to see the blessings of the covenant expressed in little children in a childlike faith In the efforts, clearly the work of the Spirit that makes them cry over their sins and try to be obedient. And that covenant youth grow up and confess their name before, confess the name of Jesus Christ before men and the angels. These are blessings that are indeed precious to us. But to whom are these blessings? They are to the godly participants in God's covenant of mercy. We've already seen that not all men are, but they are to those that fear Him. Fear is an attitude 
begins in the heart. It's an attitude of love and reverence so that a person knows God and loves God and never, ever wants to do anything that would make God unhappy with him. That's what fear is. It isn't that God wants us to be shaking and trembling in front of him, but he wants us to love him and obey him. And that's why the text also connects the two, the covenant of God to those that keep his covenant, to those that remember his commandments to do them. We can't go into it tonight, this morning, all the different places that are connected where the Bible connects the covenant of God and the commandments of God, but they are brought together in this text as they are in the baptism form. The third part of the significance of baptism is that we have a covenant of God, and as, just as there are in all covenants two parts, so are we obliged unto new obedience. When God establishes His covenant, He doesn't say now you're, the covenant depends on you, the covenant is based on your obedience, but He does say to every one of His people, I expect obedience, I expect thankful obedience to come out of you, to be a part of your life. And the child of God who has experienced the great mercy of God does not then say, oh, that means I can go and sin as much as I want. I can be careless because God will always forgive. Never. Someone who has experienced the mercy of God says, how can I show my thankfulness to God it is by obeying Him to those that keep His covenant. And the explanation is to those that remember His commandments to do them. This is the one who experiences the mercy of God. It is true, of course, that the mercy of God is upon us from everlasting to everlasting and every point in between. But the reality is that when we do not walk in the fear of God, we do not experience His mercy. The ungodly who do not walk in the fear of God at all never experience God's mercy. They only experience His wrath. But when we do not fear Him, when we do not walk in obedience, God does not just keep showering upon us mercy and making us to know the greatness of forgiveness and the power that lifts us up. He turns His eye of grace away from us and we experience trouble and sorrow. The psalmist speaks of that in many places as well. It isn't though that we earn anything, is it? Because don't forget, His mercy was upon us from everlasting. So you've never earned it. God has never yet saved anybody because they were faithful enough, because they feared Him enough. That's not it. It's all of God. And yet the experience of that, and not only the experience of it, but the continuation of His covenant is related to that. Do not instruct your children in the fear of God. Do not demand of them that they keep God's commandments. Sit like old Eli on his chair and say, Oh, you sons, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do this. But don't discipline them. And God will cut you off in your generations. But teach them the fear of the Lord, which includes discipline and bringing them up to keep His commandments to remember them. This is the way that God continues His covenant. It's all of grace. It's His power. But He demands that we walk in obedience. There is our incentive to anyone who wearies as a parent at the task of instructing children who are showing the same depravity that we have. Anyone who wearies at the work of instructing them in the fear of the Lord. There is your incentive. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him. May God give us that grace. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee. 
for thy eternal covenant of grace and for the mercy that is inseparable from it, a mercy which we've experienced, a mercy which is promised, continue to uphold us by the same power of thy eternal mercy. And continue thy covenant, we pray, with us and with our children. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.